Flonzy Brown Wright was born in Farm Haven, Mississippi, but her family later moved to Canton, where she would later make a name for herself. Her father worked as an electrician, and her mother was a stay-at-home mom who also worked as a seamstress. Wright attended Holy Child Jesus Catholic School in Canton, a school with a primarily white staff. I really didn't know a lot about segregation at that point because mom and dad made a concerted effort uh, to shield us uh, from the ugliness of racism. However, she was in the midst of it during that time and didn't know what was wrong. She recalls going to what was called the hollow in Canton, a place where blacks could get medical care, shop, dine, and enjoy time with their families. Something she says they had limited access to in other areas. And when mom would go uptown and buy our shoes, uh, and, I, and I, I, knew, I knew this growing up, but did not understand the significance that she would take a little piece of string and measure our feet. And then she would take that piece of string up to the shoe store and buy shoes for us based on that string. Wright says blacks weren't even allowed to try on clothing. As a teen, Wright went on to marry her childhood sweetheart and move to California. It was there she saw the ugliness of the civil rights movement unfolding on the news. What really struck my attention was um, the, the Freedom Rides of 1961. I was watching how folk were being beaten and water, hot water hoses and the, horse, the horses and the dogs. And so I called mom. And I said, well, Mother, what in the world is going on at home? With the civil rights movement picking up steam, she returns to Mississippi in 1962, working at a restaurant in Biloxi. Among her customers, civil rights attorney Jack Young, who encouraged her to attend local meetings. The death of Medgar Evers was really my defining moment because I could not understand how was it that a man could be just gunned down uh, in the presence of his wife and children because of what I thought was he just attended a meeting. And so, but then, as I said, I just jumped right in it, and I, I was just in it. Wright returns to Canton in 1963 and described the movement as being on fire at the time, with several civil rights organizations setting up shop in the county seat. Despite Canton having a 70% African American population, Wright said only about 100 African Americans were registered to vote, and 10,000 had the capability to do so. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Voters' Rights Act of 1965 were passed, organizers there set up a mock election for Canton's African American population to show just how eager the black population was to vote. So we had to make a concerted effort to dispel the myth that blacks d did want to vote because once we got it, once we understood that the way out of discrimination, racism, um, was through the, the power of the ballot. Wright continued her work within the civil rights movement, going door to door to get people registered to vote. Uh, I found myself in Washington testifying before the subcommittee to send voter examiners to Mississippi to help us get through this 20 this 21 item questionnaire that blacks had to answer. As she fought for voting rights, Wright became the victim of acts of violence. I've been to jail. I've been shot at. I've been tear gassed. I've had my life threatened and the lives of my children threatened because I was involved in the civil rights movement. My dad has had work taken from him by the whites in Canton back in the day because he wouldn't make me as an adult come out of the civil rights movement. Despite the intimidation tactics used to discourage her, she continued her work and was later encouraged by civil rights activist Annie Devine and others to run for election commissioner of Madison County. Wright wasn't sure about doing that, though, especially because of her own traumatic experience. Circuit clerk told me to get the hell out of his office. Nigga told you you didn't pass. Get out of my office. And so I walked down the corridor of the courthouse where time to kill was filmed, coincidentally. And I said, you know... I'm going to get your job. I'm going to get your job because I want to be able to treat everybody the same. But she didn't get his job. She won the election for Madison County Election Commissioner in 1968, which gave her more authority over elections than the circuit clerk. It was jubilation, jubilation, uh, affirmation, a uh, confirmation. Um, now we can begin to get some things done. But change didn't come without a fight. During her four years as election commissioner, Wright said she had to sue the board several times and for a variety of reasons, including her appointments to the board, her fight to allow black jurors, 
and for the petitions of black candidates to be properly certified. Reflecting on her time as a trailblazer, Wright describes how women were essentially the glue to the civil rights movement. They chaired the mass meetings, they played the music, they taught us the freedom song, they opened up the mass meetings singing and clapping. Their names may never be in anyone's history book, but they were and played a significant role in the movement. To this day, Wright shares her story across Mississippi. I'm 76, and I've been, on, been, been doing this a long time. And I do get tired. My body gets tired. But my mind, I'm not tired yet, because there's still so much yet to be done. It was awful back then. It, 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 really, it, it really was. It was a, it was a terrible time, it, you know. And uh, it was a very dangerous time. Dolores Lynch Williams, a Jackson native, says she noticed inequality between blacks and whites at a young age. A lot of Jim Crow going on. And uh, there were a lot of um, color signs and white signs. And uh, they were on the water fountains. Uh, the, the schools were segregated. The churches were segregated. She says blacks would be belittled and addressed as boy or girl, no matter how old they were. These same people cooked at your homes, kept your kids. Sometimes they say uh, the ladies would nurse their babies. You understand? But they were not treated with any dignity whatsoever. And I thought it was horrible. It really made me very angry. As a young teenager, Williams started attending NAACP meetings here at the Masonic Temple on John R. Lynch Street and later became active in marches the organization led. And you didn't get tired of marching. I don't care how hot it was, you know, you were marching. Williams and 11 other young women and men later crafted a plan for their next fight in the civil rights movement, boycotting segregation at Jackson's Trailways bus station. Knowing that her parents would not give her permission to do so, she told them a little white lie about what was really going on. Williams told them she was going to church. Really actually did go to, to the church, but as soon as I got in, I left out of the church because it was a car out there to pick us up to take us to, to the uh, trailway bus station. When we got there, uh, we, we naturally we saw the color signs and we saw the white signs. Naturally, we did not go on the color side. We went on the white side. There, they were greeted by police officers. Uh, they told us to move. Oh, well, what are you doing here? Uh, well, I'm going to buy a bus ticket and everything. And they told no, we were not going to buy anything. And uh, they wanted us to leave, so we didn't leave. We were not disrupted of anything like that. We were very quiet. Shortly after, Williams and others in the group were arrested for disturbing the peace. But they truly disturbed my peace and everything because we were not doing anything to be arrested. We were just standing up for our civil rights, and they did not want that. Williams would then go on to have a life-altering experience. I'm 15 years old. I was not afraid. Most young people do not fear a lot of things. And I was taken to the county jail, and then I was taken to the city jail, okay? And I remained in the city jail for 11 days. 11 days alone in a jail cell while the other young women were housed together in cells. During that time, even her parents weren't allowed to see her. Really and truly, if it had not been for the grace of God, they really could have taken us off somewhere. They really could have. They really could have killed us, thrown our bodies someplace, never to be found again but God. After she was released, Williams was placed on probation for a year and was subject to frequent check-ins by police. Although she lied about getting involved in the protest, her parents were proud of her. I knew I could do what my parents could not do because during that particular time, a lot of people who would get involved in civil rights and it was found out their parents would lose their jobs, a lot of things like that. So I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything to worry about. Although she jumped into the civil rights movement at a young age and became a part of Mississippi history, she doesn't consider herself a hero. I really and truly don't, I don't consider myself as being special. At that particular time, I consider myself as being an instrument that was used by God to help bring about 
a worthwhile change. And now calls on the younger generation to bring about a worthwhile change. A lot of younger women are, are really uh, appreciative and they, they are really thankful for what the older women did at that time, you know, when we were younger women. But then they can see themselves out there too, fighting for things that they know are wrong and standing up for what's right. There was tension in the city of Jackson between the black race and the white race. And um, at, toward the end of the year, there were boycotts. The NAACP uh, had certain demands that they wanted the then mayor, Alan C. Thompson, to listen to to try to bring the, the races together. Civil rights activist Medgar Evers led these efforts and requested meetings with Mayor Thompson. The NAACP had eight demands, among them sharing public places with whites, addressing black men and women as Mrs., Miss, or Mr., and other requests that would allow black people to be treated with basic dignity. Lowry says those demands fell on deaf ears. Just a few weeks later, on June 12, 1963, Evers was assassinated in the driveway of his Jackson home for his work in the movement. It's out of that uh, turmoil and turbulent time that the then mayor, who was known for the Thompson tank and just a segregationist, uh, decided that we'll at least do three. And that was only after there was a conversation between he and then President John F. Kennedy. We have an explosive situation here. We are going to put some Negro policemen on. Alan C. Thompson said, as of September, we should have school crossing guards, and that black school crossing guards. And so that's where these ladies come in. Annie Bell Wright. Fanny Smith and Mary Gibbs, along with five other women, began working as school crossing guards on September 3rd, 1963. But there were eight guards that were strategically placed throughout the segregated black school zones at that time. Mrs. Gibbs worked at Walton Elementary School. Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Wright worked at Mary C. Jones, which is now a Head Start Center. They're taking their posts a week after the March on Washington. Wright also spent some time working at G.N. Smith, which is now just Smith Elementary School. This was a big deal for the ladies. My mother, prior to, Annie Bell Wright, prior to uh, becoming a school crossing guard, was a maid. So she worked in white people's homes uh, to help defray the cost of raising a family. Lowry says the minimum wage was $1.25 in 1963, and the women were getting $5 an hour, but only worked two hours a day, one hour in the morning, the other in the afternoons. Everyone was so proud of the fact that we had black women who were donning police uniforms, and that's the reason the calendars were put out. I mean, and everybody had a calendar at their home with our moms on there. Their work continued through the summer in 1964, which is also known as Freedom Summer. The three women worked at the Mississippi Coliseum, which acted as a makeshift jail for freedom riders because there was not any room at the city jail. They worked to supervise their own people, black people and white, because there were whites that were also a part of it, uh, in the jails. Annie Bell Wright even wrote a poem about it. In addition to the crossing guards, the city of Jackson started getting black police officers and bus drivers, something Robert Gibbs says they never had before. Jackson was becoming a city that finally was recognizing that blacks could be professionals. Mrs. Wright worked 32 years as a crossing guard and Mrs. Gibbs worked 31. Mrs. Smith worked for two years, then began her own daycare center. And I run across someone who says, how's your mom doing? And I said, well, mom's doing fine. I said, why you asked? They said, well, you know, she was my school crossing guard. So people, and this was, you know, it's been 20, 30 years ago, people still remember that time and they still related back to that time because they were so proud of the history.